You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Reports. Of course I'm meeting people who might be still not seeing each other all the time. I mean, just because I said I'm going straight, I'm not going to walk away from these people. But in the same breath, I'm not getting involved in any criminal enterprises with them. I'm going straight. I'm going. The mental health that I had at that time was something which right-minded people wouldn't accept. I reverted back, can't I? All right, they want a fight. I'm going to give them a fight. The next two people that come to this farm, I'm going to injure one of them and I'm going to get another one to witness what the injure is. And then they come back and tell their bosses, I've had enough. Take what you want. I'll go to prison. Don't come here and threaten me. The question was my dining table with eight chairs, all had armoured, <laughs> armoured vests, all around this. It's a bit like I'm somebody's uncle when I'm not. You're every cunt's uncle. Uh, and they did come up. Until I noticed, you know, they looked like SES. <laughs> They've got a flatbed, camouflage, big rifles. And I'm thinking, that interview I done with you, James, that second one I done mm -hmm. with you, I shouldn't have done that interview. My head was denied. Ben Baron. How you doing, James? Yes, and we've got the man himself, Mr. Paul Ferris. How are you, Paul? Great, James. Good to see you again. Oh, it's good to have you back, Paul. Good man, yeah. First two interviews, over two million views. High in demand, as always. Everybody loves the way you talk, your stories. The first podcast that we've done was made about your life right back to the start. Mm -hmm. we went through everything, all the stuff you've done, like the unsolved murders, all the bullshit. Second podcast was a... Uh, all about your prison life, all the jails you've been in, which was many funny, funny stories, yeah, uh, a bit comical, that one. Yeah. The, the day we're going to stick to the business years, yep. you're 20 years out of the jail, you've managed to stay out. Oh, there we go, parole officer. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, I can't take your call just now. We're discussing like, some business aspects, Brian. I'm on it live with the James uh, English. I should have had the sw phone switched on. Sorry, Brian. Sorry, but thank you. Bye bye. And just for the benefit, that that was Brian Anderson, who's got a production company. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to focus on a couple of documentary Doctor Damas. He's involved in Jack Pepper Media. Uh, should have had my phone switched off. Apologies for that. Uh -huh. And well, and that that's a, the legit bit part. Yeah, uh, it's people that that's want to focus on documentary docudramas on the basis of what is somebody's life and how can somebody from my background involved in what you'd call maybe serious and organised crime uh, disengaging with and, and, and going straight for the best part of it, uh, the anniversary which is next month on the 21st of January uh, 2022 which is 20 years James. Unbelievable, especially for the life that you've came, very well respected up and down the UK, um, for the wrong reasons and the right reasons as well, especially if you've been out for 20 years, it shows that people can change. The business years you were, you've many businesses over the years, especially books, films, like if anybody knows about business, it's yourself, Paul, but you've been fucked over a few times as well, which we'll touch on. Mm -hmm. But let's let's start at the very last time you were in prison, what jail were you in? Uh, the last time I was in prison uh, was finishing off... Uh, uh, sentence that was handed down for the old Bailey. Uh, it would be Franklin Prison in, in Durham. And I was just about to get released, uh, but I had to provide uh, some documentation on what my lawful employment would be uh, when I get released and in conjunction with my license conditions. Initially, I said to them, I'm going back into the security uh, uh, sector. And uh, some of them acted like that was a, that was a, an exorcism, you know, t twisting their head and their faces and going, no, no, you can't get back into that. I never knew what was happening in Scotland at that time or in Glasgow. Uh, there was security wars kicking off even before I got up. A couple of people got shot, a couple of things going on. So it was just an environment for me to get back into. And 
the probation service had said to me, if you feel that you want to get back out and get involved in this uh, industry, uh, you will be recalled. Uh, can you find other means of lawful employment? Which I did do. Is that hard to come out, Paul, especially uh, in the life you led to then? What was your mindset coming out, Paul, for the very last time? Did you think to yourself, I'm not going back in here, or were you thinking, I'm just going to take it day by day? Well, t before the Franklin Prison, I actually looked upon some of the documentation uh, that, that I got from my solicitors when I was on remand before the trial in Belmarsh. And the documentation I got was about what you would call uh, personal uh, defence statements and what the Crown position was. And when I get given the, the Crown documents, it became el it, uh, relevant that 12 of the documents that I was looking at was security service operatives, MI5 operatives that never gave their name. They were witness A, witness B, the whole, the whole alphabet, James. But what they had was uh, an operation on me uh, since 1996, 1997. The photographs, wiretaps uh, on my own personal mobile phone, my landline phone, my, my, my own house and there was loads of stuff there which was true and accurate and I thought do you know what see if you come to the attention of these people you might as well give up crime because I never intended to come to the attention to, to MI5 at that stage but uh, they were kind of uh, dormant on their activities because people looking back would understand that the Good Friday Agreement uh, was invoked so the MI5 and the security services never had much to do with uh, domestic terrorism so they were focused on uh, serious and organised crime in the UK and I was the first one along with uh, Arthur Sutty and my other co-defendants uh, for the investigation and uh, kind of surveillance what was on and when I looked at these documentations in, in, in Velmar, people asked me, when did you decide to go straight or go legit? Uh, it was quite clear for me when I read these and seen these in uh, 2008, even before the trial, I thought, how can somebody like me come to attention to these powerful organisations? So... I decided to accept my fate. I decided to 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 go on with my prison sentence and uh, move on. And when I was pre-released uh, for Franklin Prison, it became apparent that what I said when I got released in two thousand and one uh, was that the whole the, the whole basis on it was uh, I'm going straight. Uh, there was official uh, police statements saying that. A leopard can't change his spots. That's fair enough. But I ain't a leopard. The only spots I had was psoriasis. At the time, that's why I'm on a heart sometimes. So a leopard <clears> can't <throat> change his spot. That's fine. I've not got the brains to go straight. But here we are 20 years later, or near enough 20 years. And it's been a hard process and something which, uh, to focus on the business years, I had to uh, prove lawful employment before I was released. Uh, on the basis that they wouldn't accept the fact that I'm going back into the security industry. So I was uh, given uh, a position, a uh, sales executive and consultant from an individual uh, who was a, an Iranian uh, exile diplomat called Ben Allagher uh, on a project called St Denis Marina. What sort of security did you get into? when you came out? And what was uh, no, I was just going back into security that I was previously involved in before I was arrested. Uh, the security was 90% uh, construction, uh, making sure that uh, there's no thefts, uh, there's no fires. Uh, site agents turn up and give you the keys, on, not me personally giving me the keys, but give the keys to our agents on a Friday and they turn up on a Monday and everything's cool and they go back to their work and that repeats itself over the months. Uh, we also done some pubs, clubs and events, uh, which is kind of different, but we always decided that if we can provide a peaceful environment and a safe environment for people to work in, we're providing a, a valuable 
uh, resource to that industry. Was that a strong business to get into? Uh, at, at the time, uh, I set up a security company with a friend of mine called Archie Rollo, who was a, a big Rangers man in, in Brigton. And uh, his family, the Rollo family in Brigton, when they say they were loyalists, but they were loyalist sympathisers. And for me as a Catholic boy, to be invited down to, in, into this, it was something which they knew my dad. My dad was a Protestant. I mean, my dad was never a loyalist, but uh, they, they, they focused on demolition. And Archie Rollo and, his, and himself, uh, and anybody knows the, the old Shawfield Stadium, uh, the, the council estate adjacent to it was getting pulled down, and Archie had the contract for it. So he took me there one day and he said, Paul, we're going to start a security company and a demolition company. And I looked at this building and I thought, there's steel shutters on it, it's just a mess. It's something that I used to be brought up in Barrafield and Easterhouse and things like that. And I thought, without swearing, where's the fucking money in this? You know, and Archie had said, no, no, no. We can reclaim the slates, we can reclaim the timber, everything else. And then we need to get uh, what's called a, a grinder, uh, something which it takes all the rubble that converts the stone into grade one, grade two, and grade three. They get sold back to the roads department. And uh, I said, where do we get this machine? Oh, we hire it, it's a thousand pound a day. And that's where the first thing we came to security, because we need to secure the machine. And that's where the first company came involved in, called DEM Security, it was an abbreviation of demolition, D-E-M. That's what we set up. And the security aspect of it was looking after machines, looking after materials. And I had the offices set up in, in Domalik and a few other different places. But what I never knew was Archie Rolo had uh, a long-term illness and uh, unfortunately died before I could proceed with it. So I had a company. I had admin, I had offices, I had vehicles. Uh, and never knew the way forward until I met another guy called Tosh Walker, who had an involvement in Premier Security based in the Marnock. I never seen him bluff that. All I said was, I'm involved in security. He didn't want any competition, and we made a formal agreement that as long as he takes on my sister and anybody else who I made as employees uh, to make sure they don't lose their job, and he would take them on and, and, and wrap them up into... Uh, a, a, a kind of weave in between his company and the demolition uh, company. See the, the security, the game, it's obviously top boys, top families who have run that. Did you ever come to a head with any big families for certain tufts and money? No, none at all. I've always found out that the Premier Security ended up being the biggest independent security company in Scotland, not just in Glasgow. And that would be preceding my arrest in 1997. I did find a big change when I got back out on uh, 2002 uh, where you had to have a passport for the south side, a visa for postal and some other forms of approval to go elsewhere and I thought that's not how it was before I went to prison. Other people had took it over, there was a feeding frenzy that if somebody had a bus stop, that their gran used to get that bus for 1960s, then that's their area. It all became territorial for a, for a situation. I found it funny, because one of the first jobs I got when I got out for frontline security, I got a phone call, and I answered it. The admin should have answered it. They were away in lunch, but I answered it. Nobody knew who they were speaking to. And the phone call went along the lines, uh, what you was doing in canvas lang? And I thought, uh, can you give me any more information on this? Yeah, we've got a, a site in Canvas Lang. It's our job, and your signs are on that, on these Harris Fencing. Uh, where do you work? I said, uh, we work throughout Scotland. And the last time I looked at the map, Canvas Lang was still on the map. Still in Scotland. What is your problem? Ah, uh, we're not too happy with it. Then... Other people phoned other people, and then I got a phone call. He said, Paul, we've got somebody who's answered the phone in your company, Frontline Security, giving the other people a bit of cheek. I said, What was that about? It's about a, a, a job in Canvas Lang. 
I said it was me answer the phone canvas lying still in Scotland the last time I looked would you like to do about it we've got the contract and the reason why the, the, the strength was there was because I knew contractors for Premier Security when I was in there they know the confidence level they get the keys back on the Friday they turn up on the Monday and everything's cool on their side so word of mouth they would rather deal with us rather than unknown entities do you think you go to number one company through business strategies or because of your reputation? No, I think about both, James. Uh, a reputation don't it gets you contracts, gives people a peace of mind. But I think because of the way we treated the professional aspect of the business, because there's no point doing a business if you're not going to be a professional about it. Mm -hmm. You're either doing it properly or you don't. You ain't doing it at all. So seeing you're going into a business like that, you become the biggest in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Do you make, does it ever make you look back and go, fuck me, what was I doing involved because you've been charged with gun running? And all the that, no, the gun running w was after that, pre preceding that. Oh, Premier that Security was the biggest security, independent security mm -hmm. company in Scotland. So seeing you're doing all that legit, does it make you think, because oh, people, think, I know, pals for Glasgow, I know mm -hmm. I've got business minds, man, but they're mm -hmm. doing it in the rang. They're working in the rank field. If we just changed the strategies and went on to something different, they would make me earn money. And plus, it'd be legit. So, see, when you're doing that, Paul, like, do you think, like, clever man? So, do you think, like, we should have been more educated instead of going down the other path as well? No, no, actually, uh, I used an asset, and the asset that I had was because I'd been in the prison as a young offender and then as a young adult. You get to know all the main the main people throughout Scotland. So when there was a a security contract cropping up in Perth, Aberdeen, Dundee, uh, Dunfermline, wherever it is, I knew somebody for prison. And the biggest problems with the security was kids going on site. So if you get the main individual for that city and you're offering them a couple of hundred pounds a week to be a consultant, a my consultant, to say, don't mess about with that, that, that site. They're part of your part. So it's like a subcontractor, subcontractor thing, that they all get paid money to move on. That was a success yet. Treating people with respect in their own area. No, you can in like Johnny Bravo and say, um, whoever it is, Johnny Bravo, and this is your site and this is what they No, we give people the respect in their areas. Uh, and, and luckily for us, for me personally, even if I never knew the main head in that area, the people who I knew would know. So it's all about the finger in the pulse. Give them what they're due. All we're asking them is, let these guys go and crack on with the building. Don't be thieving, don't be burning, don't be doing what you're doing. And, and that, that, that went on for quite a, a number of months, number of years, and it worked well. It's a good formula. Uh, what about when you came out of prison for the last time? What about getting setting up bank accounts? I, that was difficult, James, to be honest with you, because come? when I got out <clears throat> on uh, 2002, uh, the requirements for the probation or the social workers, because I mentioned that I was going to get back into the security industry, it was a bit like the, the an Exorcist movie. You know, the, the faces all went, and their disapproval was noticeable. And then they, what I never knew was because I'm an English prison. There's Scottish issues going on with what they called security wars. People getting shot. Uh, contractors being intimidated, building sites being reduced to rubble and set on fire. I never really knew about it because you don't get that information when you're in, in England. So I had to concede the fact that I couldn't give any lawful employment in the security industry because they, they would refuse, I would get recalled into a contentious industry. So uh, I got a friend of mine's uh, son in law who was an Iranian, ex Iranian diplomat, to give me a position there, sales consultant. Uh, on a on a project to get out as an employee, that's how I had to do it for mm -hmm. until my license was expired. Then get involved back in the security industry in Scotland. Was there a lot of police intelligence on you, especially in the security? Well, thing? there's been a lot of police <coughs> intelligence, but one of the things I've got to bring to the attention to anybody listening to this is the intelligence. The intelligence is it uh, purely designed to make sure that somebody who's gone through the judicial system gets punished for the digital system and should be let out f free to go on with their, with their business life. It doesn't work like that. There's a lot of politics involved in it. People didn't want me involved in a variety of different businesses. The police intelligence saw it would need to do is, if you and I were, were cops, you phone 
Crime Stoppers and I've got the file, then that's our intelligence. And then we go towards other agencies like bank, uh, banking officials and use your intelligence reports and, and massage things. And it was just, it was a fantasy with, with most things. Are you still getting watched by the coppers, Paul, when you went probably, to jail? Probably, probably. You don't get access to it, James, but uh, no doubt there would have been. And if they did uh, produce true and accurate reports, of course I'm meeting people who might be still in serious and organised crime. They're friends of mine. Just because I said I'm going straight, I'm not going to walk away from these people. But in the same breath, I'm not getting involved in any criminal enterprises with them. I'm going straight. I'm going legit. Is that hard for the coppers as well? Because the old being question marks all your head that because of you. That, that's involved. truly a matter for them, James. Yeah. It's not for me to decide which. They, they decide to be evidence gatherers. They've decided to be involved in police activities. If they get the evidence, get it. Don't massage the evidence and don't manufacture it. Mm-hmm. Because you've gave us a list here, obviously a lot of people don't know your business years, a lot of people know mm-hmm. your stu- stuff through books and mm-hmm. all, the, all the shit that's been in the papers, films, but the business stuff is kind of a different level, you never spoke about before, but mm-hmm. you've got a lot of stuff down here so we can hit every target. What's the court security speed cameras tagged? Well, you had a lot of uh, media reports on saying Ferris is now gar- uh, uh, guarding uh, Dumbartonshire of court. Uh, Ferris's company is now guarding speed cameras on the M8. The reality is that my son Paul was given specific instructions to be a junior supervisor who had a load of signs in the back of the car, who was then in a marked vehicle, frontline security vehicle with a proper driver, who was a supervisor, and the remit was given to him any Harris fencing that you see is not signed, tag it. Mm-hmm. And he done that for Monday, if, sorry, for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We were getting phone calls on Monday saying, the fuck's happened here? <laughs> Why are you guarding the Barton Sheriff Court? We never. It was just Harris fencing that these signs was put up. Sunday Mail jumped on it. Strathclyde Police jumped on it. We were never guard- guarding any p- p- public buildings, courts or speed cameras. And anybody who thought we had to have the contracts on it was misguided. Good PR for the newspapers, good source material for salacious uh, media reports, but we never had it. It was just two people, one the supervisor who was a driver, another one was my son, was too eager to look at the specifics and the scope of works. Any fencing that you don't see, it's got a sign, put our signs up. And they'd done it for Dumbarton to, to Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden, because it's a sign up, we've got the contract. It's not, it's just, it, it should never happen, but it, it was a good bit of PR. They mentioned it in the newspapers, and people thought we had government contracts, and we never. Did you ever get people using your signs and kidding on Aye, we did, we, we did. Aye, we'd find a few of them. <laughs> we'd done a few of them. But when we did find it out, they, they were getting bullied for other security companies, and we never really minded it so much. So mm-hmm. we yeah. never took any money off them, but uh, there was a few, no as many, but there was a few. Mm-hmm. And fair play to them. But they Does get that no bother you, no? No, no. It's a bit like I'm somebody's uncle when I'm not. You're every cunt's uncle, oh, mate, and fucking and, and, Glasgow. And, and then sometimes people had terrorist fencing and went, bang, we'll put frontline security up. It gave them a bit of confidence, but in a business sense, I couldn't allow it. If they want to come under the umbrella frontline and get a contract up, fine. If they don't want to, Use front line and get the signs off, put their end signs up. Mm-hmm. But we never minded that, we never. You must have been making good dough, number one in Scotland, the security. Yeah. What was your plans? Were you trying to settle down, get a gaff outside the Glasgow? No, gaff? just something which uh, I looked into. Uh, I was involved in the security before I went to prison. Uh, when 2002 became about the f- employee status for myself to, to get involved in St. Denis Marina project, which purely to satisfy. The, the privation and not get involved in the the main security aspects. But after that, time scale was up. I, I did get involved in it. Uh, what was the plan? The plan was to make sure that we can get back to being the best and the biggest security company in Scotland, bef- independent security company in Scotland, before and what it was before I went to prison. Mm-hmm. I know you like your farmhouses. Was that one of your first plans? Was to get a farmhouse? No, and settle no. Down? To, to be honest with you, James, I got a, the first property I ever bought uh, was a flat in uh, the Adrossan 
uh, marina uh, called Mariner's View. And the reason why I bought a flat in there because my mum, after 40 years he'd been involved in Black Hill, eventually moved into uh, Stevenson and Adrossen. Uh, my family's been in Stevenson. My mum actually got, got a house in Adrossen. And I used to go and visit her. And one of the things she used to say was, it took her 40 years to get for Black Hill and all the chaos. Uh, don't you, a quiet place in Adrossen. And I was welcome there any time, but there was a rule. If I'm in there before nine o'clock, the front door's locked. If I get there after nine, the door's locked. If you're in, you're in, you're out, you're out. That's typical Glaswegian mm. mammy would say. Sometimes my business took us towards after nine o'clock. So I bought a flat down there in the, in the, uh, the marina uh, in Adrossen, uh, Mariner's View. Purely allowing me, if I was coming back down to see my mum after nine o'clock, I sleep up there, I get the kids and I go and see my mum on the, on the Saturday morning. But the, the farm was, was, was totally different. The farm was which uh, ended up uh, involved in a relationship. Uh, we're due to get married. Uh, my partner was, the, was pregnant at the time. And she looked at the farm as an acquisition. And I looked at uh, like a Georgian property that you could renovate and do it and, and make up, make it nice on what it was. So we had a dual uh, decision and both would go and see different properties. The problem was that with the Georgian property that I fact, when I went to visit it, I uh, couldn't see it because it was in a gully somewhere down in a, a valley. The photographs that was online made it look really good, but... The minute you looked down, you thought, nah, it ain't for me. Let's go and look at this farm. I don't want to buy a farm. I'm not a farmer. <laughs> yeah, right? but why do I want to buy a farm? Uh, but it was something which was five acres. It, the, the farmhouse was built in 1737. My wife at that time wanted to buy it and settle down, and I thought, I'll buy it for her. And that's what I did do. But I could prove legitimately how I could buy it. I'd reasonable source of uh, income reasonable uh, reasonable source of funds uh, and, and I did that but it was a big job a lot of people said to me Paul why don't you buy a plot of land and get a new build done my wife never picked a plot of land and a new build done she picked this farm and I'm going to be a farmer and that's what i done I loved it I absolutely loved it what was people who sent you then obviously when you kind of well, changed then I was in there for about two or three weeks right and uh, it was a friend of mine, it was Tam Began. He turned up with a gift, cardboard box. I never knew what a cockerel was. I never knew what a hen was. I knew what pigeons were. I knew people used to fly the do's and the schemes and things. But as a farmer, I got a, a hen and I got a cockerel. And then a couple of weeks later, I've got loads of chickens. And a couple of weeks after that, I've got 25 chickens, cockles, and <laughs> so I, beca I became the enforcer. <laughs> Somebody done a view on it and said, uh, what are you doing now? The, the, the beautiful thing about it, a lot of people from my background and anybody that's been involved in concrete jungles and maybe deprived areas, getting into the fact that you're on a farm and you've got this shell that's an egg, that's making a noise and you video it and a chicken comes at it in your own hand. It's a beautiful experience. Never, ever experienced anything like that in my life. And I've done it about four or five times. But I did, we did lose quite a lot of chickens because we never knew how, well, I never knew how to manage them. They, they, they died through, I, I don't know, maybe starvation, maybe there was probably 95% we saved, but there is a failure rate. Uh, and, and for me it was a humbling experience getting a, a live thing like an egg that transforms into a chicken that you grow up to feed and they get it was just brilliant for me it was just immense did you ever get the foxes in eating them? aye bastards aye. aye well what happened was uh, I forgot to shut one of the, the doors which cut outside buildings that were designed for livestock but we put the chickens in there and one of the occasions we went up to Stirling for a view on, uh, it was an antiques fair. And I remember driving up thinking, I never shut that door. 
and it was only a couple of hours they then come back down. We lost about 20 chickens. Now, I used to think foxes were curious and kind of sultry creatures that you could maybe look at and go, ah, they are a bit fly, they're a bit uh, mischievous about what they're doing. They'd done 25 chickens. If I had a shotgun there, I'd have shot, the ch- I'd have shot that fox. <laughs> I would have, I would have. Because I, I took my daughter in the next day to feed them and there was just feathers everywhere. And f- f- Matter of fact, I actually had a chicken, had a chicken that had escaped the fox that much. It lost its back plumage. It kept staring at the wall. It had post-traumatic stress. And when I talked to people that had a chicken with post-traumatic stress, they laugh and go... What the fuck are you talking about? Mm-hmm. How did you know? Because this chicken kept looking at the wall. It's it, <laughs> it survived the fox. <laughs> it survived the fox. But my whole art, my whole attitude changed. For this fox decimated my pets, and they all had names. The kids all gave them names like Spike, Jill. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they were all gone uh, because I never shot this this door. Were you guilty? Feel guilty? I did. Didn't I? I did. Matter of fact, what I, what I did was, I ended up f- saying to the next farmer, could I get some of these pest control people up? And they did come up. Until I noticed, fucking hell, they looked like SES. <laughs> They've got a flatbed, camouflage, big rifles. And I'm thinking, right, they're going to get plotted up on this farm. All it takes is a helicopter up there with a heat sensor on it to think, which Ferris down there, down there with these sniper rifles? I gave them 50 quid to go away. <laughs> I said, just forget the foxes, leave it. <laughs> They're talking about triangular yeah. killing zones, and, and I thought, oh, I don't want to hear anything about this. Here's 50 quid, just go away. Let, let's deal with it. Is that what they do, the extent they go on it? Aye, very professional, and... aye, they're brilliant. Brilliant, but I couldn't have it on there because they thought it was me lying in the field with a sniper. Because it, th- th- when I got released from prison, I signed a document that I could never have access to a firearm for my lifetime otherwise I get 10 years I'm allowed to look at them but I can't clap them or touch them and, and I don't want anything uh, remotely saying that there's his farm and that could be him with a camouflage on with this, this rifle so mm-hmm. for me moving them on and saying leave the fox let things I'll just shut the door just air your 50 quid go away HMRC put a big investigation on you in 2012 mm-hmm. How was that for you to deal with? Uh, I, I fully accept it, J- James, uh, because when I got out for prison in, in 2002, I was an employee for a company called St Denny's Marina Project that uh, should have paid my PAY and NIC. And it wasn't until maybe, maybe 2002, 2003, there was a guy called James Mervin that, that took over Frontline Security. And because I was attached as a consultant, they gave me a P60 form to sign. I never knew about P... I'm just learning about normal business. Uh, it trans- transferred that my PAYC, PAYC and NIC was never paid by the St Denny's uh, Marina Project. And I thought, that's fucking strange, that. Uh, and then I, I, I dismissed it because the person who I was involved with was a, an Iranian a diplomat and it turns out to be a customs agent that turns out to be HMRC and I thought this is just a big fucking game here if they weren't paid come and tell me how much I owe them and I'll pay them but unfortunately it rumbled on it in a few years so when the, when I get the, the farm was ready in 2012 uh, it was qu- kind of surreal uh, by that time I'm I'm married uh, I've got three kids my wife's in bed Three kids are in bed. I've opened the door. Very civil, I might say. But the door never get put on. It's no one of these mad raids. Like gas grenades and mm. on the floor and all the rest of it. No, somebody did the decent to chop the door and I did decency to open it. Uh, but what I saw was <laughs> quite surreal. All big fucking rugby players with armoured the vests on. And all I asked was, who's in, who's in charge? And somebody stepped forward and said, Paul, I'm in charge. We're here to investigate. But I said, can you give me a minute? I'm going to go and wake my wife up. She's still in bed. I don't want my, I don't want my kids frightened. It's a family environment. You're more than welcome to come in. And thanks for the decency. You chopped the door and no kicking it in. So by the time I went up and woke my wife up and told her that <laughs> we were getting raided, she's asked me all sorts of questions. Why are we getting raided? And I don't know. If I knew, I'd have told her. 
So eventually she gets up to bed, gets the kids sorted. Uh, there was loads of people there, armed response. For, but I liaised with the main guy that's in charge, uh, and he indicated, follow, there's a female the WPC there, it'll do with your wife. Uh, there's another uniformed cop there. That I looked at, he was just a young boy. He was a, he, oh, he, oh, he was a police officer, he was just a young boy. So they two get allocated to look after my wife and my kids. And I'm looking at these other guys walking about with the, the bulletproof vests on and earpieces, and it was like a fucking proper SWAT raid. And I'm thinking, what have I done? And I never done nothing. At that stage, and they, people don't want to hear you've done nothing at that stage. They're there for a reason. I don't know why they're a bit be, becomes quite apparent. So I ended up speaking to the one in charge, and I went, "Look, you're in a family environment here. Uh, what I would like is a request to de-escalate the visual stuff that I'm looking at because it's quite aggressive. Can you get your guys to take the the, the vests off? They're still in uniform." and engage in a, a, a pub, a, a, a family environment here without frightening my wife and my kids. They don't know, I know I'm accustomed to this, but it's a, it's a request, can you ask them to de-escalate it? Not a problem. And one of them, who, <laughs> it's a big fucking rugby player, one of them had walked past me and went, nice one, wee man. <laughs> so this whole surreal situation was my dining table with eight chairs, all had armoured <laughs> armored vests, or on this table. By the time my wife's up, she gets separated in another room. The WPC in the uniform, uh, the WPC was looking after my daughter. The other PC's looking after my kids. And they're pulling me building blocks. And I'm thinking, this is fucking surreal here. Go and do what you want. Whatever you're looking for, they'll not tell you what you're for. But it was uh, an HMRC investigation into... Money laundering, proceeds of crime, seizing computers, documentation. They don't announce when they're going to come and see you. They just pounce like that. But they've done it in a very dignified and professional way that I accepted. And uh, and the professionalism that they were showing uh, on the day and de-escalating the, the aggressive visual stuff by taking the body armour off was, uh, was well received. And they went and done their duty. They were there for, I don't know, six hours, eight hours. See if they show you respect, are you happy that... I, I think it's a matter of image, James. You know, they're there to do a job. <clears throat> uh, they've targeted me for whatever information. They allowed me to get my wife and kids sorted out without coming in. Uh, there was a meeting of minds. I'm dealing with the main guy that's involved with it. He's dealing with me. I'm the guy of the house. He's the guy of the raid. Uh, they've de-escalated the, the kind of aggressive uniform nature. Took off their armoured uh, waistcoats and, and just became normal people doing a search. There was also a couple of uh, female uh, HMRC that was out and they kept looking through my, my book collection and one of them had said to me, I love your collection of books, have you read all of them? And I never, they were just an antique shop that I put up there. And I told an honest man, I think they were a bit disappoint, disappointed. They thought it was well read. It was just a stage prop. But she did turn around and said, your kids are beautiful. You've raised them well. And having that for, for a point of view, during the raid, it was just nice. A lot of people think, uh, they come up and smash a door in. And, uh, d -d 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 -d. They could have, but they never. Mm -hmm. And that's why I complied with them. So it was... Uh, a meeting of minds, it was an equilibrium, they've got to investigate and I've got to comply. Yeah. See when you're going through, when you're active, going through a life of crime and then going through the business years, Paul, try mm -hmm. to go legit. Mm -hmm. What side of the coin do you feel as if you end up with mere, because I'm legit, mm -hmm. but I feel as if I, I deal with mere shit now that I'm legit than I did and I didn't give a fuck. I think, so I, think the honest life, I think the honest value, James, is I know what to speed on about, but there was another investigation further mm -hmm. down the line uh, I took control of a situation that, where a client was involved and he was due three, three million quid back. I got the, the guy who was involved in it, he declared that he two other partners, and we thought it had been a big too long story, he admitted liability of a million pound. And he wanted me to negotiate terms with the creditor to say, Paul, I'll give you five grand a week if you can negotiate until give us a bit of breathing space. 
And because I get involved with this one, there was a lot of madness involved in involved in another in situation. But getting back to the being involved in legitimate enterprises, I, I felt in the last uh, two, three years, the stress value for me uh, being threatened by uh, agencies, that what they're going to do financially and I just felt personally attached towards, I've never walked away from a challenge, uh, maybe I've accepted a few fights and maybe I won and maybe I don't won but this is something which it was seriously affecting me that my wife and my kids moved because of all the, all the hassle that was going on and domestic hassle. So I was left in the farm on my own. Uh, my son was there, Dean, at the time. And there was one occasion where I just missed two agents, either HMRC or other agents had been sent uh, to force their views on what they were going to do and seize the farm and seize the accounts and kind of put me in my place sort of thing. And I'm thinking, all right. So I missed it too. And then I was on the, the the farm and I've got CCTV and I just missed another two. At the same time, I'm getting letters through. And this letter opened up, it's a brown letter and a brown envelope. And people understand that when they get brown envelopes, it's no full of cash under a table. It's to do with this is an official thing. And I opened it up and I read it. And it was more or less a threat. You don't do this, we're taking this. And I thought, I need to phone this number because pri private that I'd done a deal with HMRC uh, for, on uh, committing the fact that at least between 7 and 10 million quid had been paid to them through a variety of different companies in my control. My personal liability was probably high six-figure sum. But the problem was I was dealing with a, a, a case agent in, in Liverpool who, who dealt with the UK. Uh, HMRC uh, payments but what I never realised was Scotland got its devolved powers to deal with its own taxation and collection and when I f phoned this number up I had a, an English, uh, sorry, a, a Glaswegian accent and I thought well that's good make me understand, maybe there's something there that a Glaswegian speaking to a Scouser that's, there's a language barrier somewhere so a, a Glasgow guy speaking to a, I don't know if it's a Glaswegian, but it's a Scottish accent and all I got was threat after threat after threat, and I thought, are you fucking threatening me here? If you don't do this, we'll do that. And it wasn't until I looked at the, the, the address. It's in Gart Kosh, this super MI5 headquarters that they've got, HMRC, uh, serious and organised crime, uh, and other agencies under the one umbrella. And I'm speaking to them, I phoned this number, which I thought was Liverpool who had been dealing with. When I noticed the change in numbers, I understood the change in attitude. And uh, no long after, I, had, I did have properties on the market. I was selling them on the basis. I had, I had to sell anyway, there's no the escape for that. I had to prove where the source of income was coming for, for to pay these people. Because I could have asked friends of mine, but the problem was for me to ask for a quarter million quid on a payment transfer and the, the payment reference would be HMRC to come to me to pay HMRC. I don't know what other business people were doing. They might have not be paying their tax, they might be doing different things. Might cause them different issues. The only person that could pay these uh, things were me and I had to relinquish assets to pay them because I had that and I proved that there was never any mortgage fraud. I was in a sufficient income bracket that I could easily afford all this. That's what the HMRC investigation was. There was never any mortgage fraud. I was getting a sufficient amount of income every year to prove that I could buy these things. So for me to dispose of assets, to pay what these people were looking for, I had to do it, but it took too long. You're only as good as the, the goods you put in the market. You need to find the people in the market that's wanting to buy it. And by that time, it was a year down the line. The properties were still on the market. And I found that people weren't, weren't they believing me, what I'm trying to do. And, and that was a hard I was getting fucking stressed out of it, really. 
much did they try and do you for? Oh, and uh, not too much trying to do me. It was my liability, James. I'd, I'd figures to pay, and I was reliable for, for paying these figures. What I didn't like was the, the threats and what they're going to do. And uh, it, it came to a situation where I was waiting on another set of uniforms coming up. And I had enough at that stage because I probably had a bit of mental health issues that I know about now how to deal with it. But at the time, there was just loads of stuff. I felt as though I was getting backed into a corner. I felt as though they want me to go and commit offences to, to raise that revenue. And I wasn't prepared to do that. Uh, people might say, well, that's your own fault. And it was. But the mental health that I had at that time was something which right-minded people wouldn't accept. I reverted back, can not All right, they want a fight, I'm going to give them a fight. The next two people that come to this farm, I'm going to injure one of them, and I'm going to get another one to witness what the injure is. And then they come back and tell their bosses, I've had enough, take what you want. I'll go to prison, don't come here and threaten me. Don't send your foot soldiers to come and threaten me. And in that train of thought, I seen two uniforms one day, and I thought, all right, here we're going. I actually told my son, after, I fell out with my son, cosmetically, because I didn't want him there to see what his dad's capable of doing. I told him to go back to his mum, I wanted to be on my mind, because I'm going to deal with this, James. It's just an I, I I'm no bigging myself up. I just had enough. And there was an occasion where there was two other suits that came into the farm. Got them on CCTV. I've got a weapon on me. I'm not tell you what the weapon was, but the weapon's there for, to be used. Uh, and I'm going to use it. And I opened the door and I shouted to them, what the fuck you want now? And this one turned round with his chest, with his arm on his chest, and I noticed it's a Gideon's Bible, the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> and and I, what was running through my head was, uh, I've going to, in fact, violence in these people, it's going to be over the news, look what he's done to the men of God. And I thought it was a divine intervention at this Same. stage to say, you fucking calm down here. This is not for you. And usually these people, I'm not being disrespectful if people with religious beliefs and things like that, but normally they come in and want to spend two hours talking to you. <coughs> I did invite them and I put the weapon away and I thought, you want to tear a coffee? I'm totally calm after that. And I thought, wow, I could have made the biggest fucking mistake in my life. Uh, it's funny now and I'm laughing, but I shouldn't be laughing anyway. Uh, anyway, I got them in and offered them tea and coffee. And the mindset for me, I took this weapon out and put it on the table <laughs> while they're having a coffee and they've looked at it and I thought, oh, sorry, that wasn't for you. I thought these were somebody else. After 10 minutes, they want to go. <laughs> they're not finished 30. And I'm laughing, I shouldn't laugh, but it's terrible. But that's the corner I was pushed on here. That was something in which uh, it's not right. It's my fault. I could have reacted differently at but I, I took a lot of lessons out of the fact that these people come into my life at that time for their religious beliefs to come and visit me. I thought they were somebody else and I was ready to deal with that situation and people might think, he's no changed. He still got this on his head. But people must understand, if you don't give somebody a fire exit, what they expect it to do? You push if you want to a corner, you send agents to threaten, you're going to take property, you're going to disrupt bank accounts, you're going to seize assets. Don't send foot soldiers because they're liable to get injured. We've had enough. Thought we had a deal. So even you see no Paul Ferris coming out there, does that it play did. a part in about a bullying that you probably felt yourself in? Uh, it, 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 it was bullying, James. Um, I'm no jumping on it. It was financial bullying. It was... The bullying I had as a kid, I could identify the individuals. I can go and deal with them. When you're dealing with an organisation, who do, who, do you do, who do you fight with? So there, there are thousands of people involved in it. If they're silly enough to send foot soldiers to me, I'll deal with it. I'll not deal with two of them. One's going to witness what's going to happen to another one. Is that 
Is that right? No, it's not. I know it's not right. But to me, it was right at the time. That put me in a bad place. Was that how far it took you that you oh. were willing to go to the jail, Paul, to... Oh, uh. Uh. And that was the HMRC thing that was just a couple not of years a ago? Not a problem. This was uh. a new HMRC investigation? Uh, this would have been... 2018. Nine, 18, 19, wasn't uh, it? Uh, so I remember speaking to you about it all. Uh, um, that interview I'd done with you, James. That second one I'd done mm. with you. I shouldn't have done that interview. My head was denied. I'm just glad you were talking about different things. Gave me a release mm -hmm. to go there. But I couldn't duck the interview because it was a request. Mm -hmm. Can't say it to you, to James, I'm not involved in this. But anybody who's looked at uh, the new book that I've done with, with Steve Wraith, and looks at any of the photographs, my face was like a, not being racist here, looked like a red Indian for America. It was full of psoriasis, through stress. And people might say, oh, good for you, I hope it was worse. Some people might say, let's understand this guy, where he's came from. How you can come for a, a back, and I'm not playing the violin, James. It's something which... If I can't look at the bullying aspect and focus on who's going to get a better treatment, when it was HMRC that was involved in it, aye, they want to send foot soldiers, then that's unfortunately that's going to wait to be. I've not, it was, a, it was a come on, it was a fight. It was something which we're going to do this to you. And I'm just glad my wife and my kids weren't there at the time because they'd have had no compassion now that they come out and go in a couple of black bags, get it? That's my fault. It'd been a failure in business, not to comply with payments. And they talk about, I'd rather sit here just now talking about what I've paid and what I've helped to pay, rather than having critics jumping on and saying, he's a bit rich. That would have been so many nurses, so many doctors, so many police, so many fire brigade, so many emergency services that could have been employed. I paid enough for a full fucking fire brigade crew. For food. And, I, and I don't mean to dismiss it when I say that anybody who wants to fact check go and check HMRC Frontline Security Star Law Biometrics Proview CCTV Jai H Recruitment all these companies that I was involved in that help pay PAYC and NIC millions of pounds don't get any credit for it but because they flip it and Scotland gets its uh, own devolved powers of uh, taxation. They want to crucify me. I'm good. See the investigation in 2012, is that, is that linked to the one? No, no, 2012 was uh, the one with the body armour. It was something which, by the time I got a financial advisor involved in it, and they looked through it, oh, the words were, Paul, all you've been given is a financial H, uh, uh, MOT here. All the properties that you've bought, is sufficient, your income sufficient, the only thing you've no paid is your PAYE and your NIC. And I told them that when I discovered as an employee that this didn't happen with the P60 form, I've just made a transition for coming for what people call a serious, and organised crime environment into a legitimate environment. And I've got to go and then make a complaint and tell authorities that this guy's no paid my tax. If I'm prepared to go and do that, what's other people that's going to think that's alive and well that was involved with me in criminality before I walked away? They might think, well, if he's going to talk about that, he might talk about something else. What would have put a threat on me? So when I explained the reason for the delay in this explanation is because you're here now, I'm now explaining to you, I fully accept all oh, yes, these monies tell me how much I owe you and we'll pay it. That's what the deal was. And they were happy with it. And you sorted the deal Done. Done deal. Done. And you think that's the end yet? No, no. I could only pay them so much. It was a three, it was a six figure sum. I gave them sufficient amount. By the time that deal was, I, I was dealing with a case agent that, that dealt with the whole HMRC in the UK. By the time I got done to the last, maybe 25 grand, uh, Scottish uh, devolvement and powers for taxation, they want to jump on that and make me bankrupt for 25 grand after everything that's been paid. And I thought, this is just no fucking right. Mm -hmm. This, you know, I'm waiting on 
assets to be sold. It's, I'm at the mercy of the market. That's all it is. And I felt under an extreme amount of... It's gone now, James. I can talk about it now. I sold the farm and the properties for 400 grand less than what I bought them for, just to get the deal done. I've currently lost 72 grand a year in, in income through security because they were wanting to get the individuals to give a statement under oath that I'm involved in the company. And when I heard that, I shook their hands and said, I don't want you to go through this process. I've had wages out of this for 15 years. I'm doing one thing now. Shake your hand. Go and activate the sworn statement under oath and tell them, yes, I was involved in security, but I ain't now, because they're trying to take the licence off them, try to take the bank accounts off them, because of me. It's just vindictiveness, but the flip side of the coin, James, and being totally honest, if I'm a cop looking at me, I would have done it. I'd have used every resource to squeeze me. Would I have been right? I don't know. Is it is it today because of how they've been exposed in the past? They don't like it? Probably. It's not my fault. If they get paid for a job today what they're doing, do it. Don't produce witnesses that are going to perjure themselves against me. Don't put drugs in my pocket and become a drug dealer. Don't try and fit me up for guns and become a gun dealer and jump behind a badge and kid on your style of cop. Doesn't know what? Do you feel as if they squeezed you more because of who you're talking It's all to do with politics, James. It's went beyond me. It's went beyond exposing a rancid regime to the public through books, trials and all the rest of it. They've got to go over it, not me. Do they think, even though you've been it for 20 years now, do you think there was a part of them thinking he'll make a mistake, he will eventually ah, get yeah. him and he'll oh, be in well, jail? The, 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 fam the, the famous one is, a leopard can't change its thoughts. Good. A leopard is an animal. I'm not an animal. People think I'm an animal. I might have spots. It's called psoriasis. It'll change. What do you feel the mere pressure in life comes with, Paul? Like the pressures of the legit business or the pressures of the streets? Legit business. A hundred times. Uh, it's kind of humbling experience. When you're on the streets, you've got assets to... If you need money, you go and get money. Uh, I don't want to speak too much about other things that have never been mentioned, but... In order for us to get money, where's the best place to get money? Ready cash, banks. Mm -hmm. It's mad though, isn't it? Like you mm. learn a lot about you and it shows you how fast you could have slipped back oh. into that with the pressure. No, I couldn't do it. I'd let a lot of people done. Did you feel like a failure at that time, Paul? Uh, not so much a failure. I'm, I'm, I'm involved in a new business. It's called uh, Legitimate Business. I'm learning. I'm learning about the pressures. I'm learning about the struggles. And I thought... Fuck that, it's, it's a hard transition. In full respect to anybody who's trying to do it. Mm -hmm. But what I couldn't understand was weird, that you've got to declare your assets and your, your income and pay them up front before you earn. Surely that's a bit... Like, Sheriff of Nottingham sort of thing, you know what I mean? Gives your door before you even do anything. You've got to pay them before you earn. It's, it's no, it's called pay as you earn, no pay before you earn. That's what I couldn't understand. And the mistake I made is, I never had financial advisors, but I did end up with one who was very good, done the deal for me, no mention his name, but his ex-HMRC that told me, Paul, draw a line in the sand, we'll get this done, and I did. And I thought that was done. And then uh, when friends of the family came up to visit, uh, who were going to Northern Ireland for commercial reasons to buy tractors and plant machinery. They saw my f my face betrayed how I was. My face was uh, unsightly. But unsightly just now, but not as bad then. Because it's, people say your eyes are the mirror of your soul. My face betrayed how I was. I was trying to uh, maintain a confidence but people who knew me looked at it and go, what's wrong with you? And when the minute I told them about the threats for HMRC and all the rest, they went, stop, use your financial advisor. And I did. And I'll mention this guy's name, Andy Green. He's from England. He bought me a couple of weeks because these conversations with me and these people are not getting anywhere. Seriously. 
And when I told Kim about having to tell Dean to go back to his mum's because something's going to happen, she was worried about me. But she offered a, a remedy in, in a business sense. Now I'm trying to find a transition here and get involved in. I don't like threats for anybody, especially with facely photo and letters. And I just had enough of it. But this guy Andy Green bought me uh, six weeks, and that six weeks allowed me to get my head together and, and see things a bit more clearly mm-hmm. and do what I'm doing. But the, the same factor still arises. I've got properties on the market. The market's only as good as a buyer. You take fresh fruit to the market. Maybe no, somebody's wanting to buy fresh fruit, fresh fruit, but you've got the belief in what you can sell. You're subject to mar- market conditions. That's all it was. Because you've got the jail for it, Paul? No, not for that. There's nothing, there was nothing illegal involved in it. They, just, they could have seized assets mm-hmm. and, and different things like that. I could have went to jail for what my actions were going to do. But if they hurt you, with your tax bill, you didn't pay it? No, no, it's not to do with that. It's the tax bill, it's just... Mm-hmm. Do you get back blacklisted? There's not, there's no prison time involved. In it. There's never, t- James. I've been out of prison since I've been a teenager. Prison don't frighten me. Uh, the financial thing, it was to do with the threats. It's to do with the bullying, the corporate bullying. We're going to do this. You don't do that. Good. I, I, I could have made a massive mistake and then spent a massive amount of years for doing something that should never have been merited. So. Uh, there's always good fortune somewhere down the line. Now I can reflect and look back on it, give you the exclusive position of what could have happened, but never. But there's still that element of pressure, for understanding what the business pressures are about, make sure you pay your taxes, make sure you, you commit yourself. But I'm not going to have uh, anybody in government jumping on the board and saying, he never paid, we lost police, nurses, doctors, fire brigade, emergency services, look at the amount of people who could have been employed if he paid his bill. I did. So surely it's fair for me to say, what I've paid is, I've got all these people jobs. I'd rather have been in a position to say, I've paid 95% of my commitments. Don't fucking crucify me for the other 5%. Mm -hmm. And make yourself a big deal only because you've got executive powers in Scotland. That's why I'm in England now, James. Scotland's <laughs> caught me up there on the top of the Christmas tree. <laughs> what a big f- <laughs> going like that. You're fucking like getting you're getting you're getting whacked. Uh-huh. We're taking you the whole road, and it's not for my tax position. It's to do with politics that their colleagues throughout the judiciary, throughout the police force, and throughout the prosecution service that never had the evidence to convict me other than the, the procured perverse fabrications and what they've tried to do. They exposed themselves. I helped to do it for them. So there's politics involved in it, especially with all under a one roof and Gart Kosh. Mm-hmm. And when you mention Gart Kosh, and you, people fact check who's in Gart Kosh, who's in this FBI headquarters, they're all there. Drink, they go to a canteen and don't talk to each other. You kidding me on? Mm-hmm. Always a case of get Ferris, get this, bankrupt him, do this, do that. Is it? I had a position where I was getting information back for financial gatherers who their remit, working for the Crown, was to recover finances. The minute they made somebody bankrupt, they'll not get any finance because they've done their job, they've, they've done it. But what they get subject to was evidence gatherers in the same building who were serious and organised crime, who were sent to, to the evidence gatherers, were sent to the financial gatherers, put him down, liquidate him. And they're saying, no, we're there to collect funds, and he's got assets and what we're trying to collect. Why are you telling us to put him down? Because you've not got the evidence in your evidence gatherers for you to put him down yourself. Don't tell us to do your job that you can't do yourself. So there's decent people doing the right jobs at the right time under that same roof. And I do believe that whatever criticism people think I've got about the police and all the rest of it, they're not all corrupt. There's some more than others. The same way the prosecution service, did they manage, manufacture and procure p- 
perjured us to give evidence. Of course they do, but no, them all. The judge, what does he do? He sits and listens. What does a jury do? They listen to debates like this, James, and read books and other trials, not just about me, but other things that went wrong. They decide when they sit and listen now. That's what they don't want, to corrupt future jury members, to sit there and listen to evidence that they'll question a bit more. So for me, I have challenged that. Uh, politics in Scotland, they're, they're too vicious. Uh, I've no run away. I've just uh, accepted a position in England to help people out because they're physically no capable of doing it themselves. When I say physically no capable, they're old and frail. Uh, some with hip tra transplants, knee transplants, some with health issues that I've known for many, many years and asked me, Paul, what would you see yourself in the future? And I couldn't answer them. I was under combat fatigue for 18 months, trying to resolve my position. And I said to him, what do you want me to do? Uh, would you like to start as a, a yard management? I'll not tell you what it is, I'll tell you in private what it is, but I took it on. It was a humbling experience. I loved it, and I'm still doing it. And I've no finished yet, and I'll continue to do it. Still here to tell the tale. Ah, Move on to the next that's chapter, one. Paul, innit? That's the one, eh? Let's go into, uh, we'll touch on the film first, The mm -hmm. Wee Man. Uh, Martin Comston played mm -hmm. your main character. I know we kind of touched on it in the first podcast, but we'll touch on the film, the books, Reg mm -hmm. McKay. What about uh, the film when the idea came up? Were you excited for it? How, what was your emotions when uh, the, your books no, were No, uh, to me it was just another avenue to help uh, expose the corruption. Uh, if there was 90% of nonsense in the movie and 10% and showing the corruption. I'd have been happy with that anyway. Uh, it's to shine a light on things that they don't want to shine a light on. It's a bit like earning the dirt, dirty laundry in public and seeing the big skid marks and going, oh, the neighbours going, did you see what that big mark near drawers was? That, that was, don't mean to be vulgar, but that's just the way in which how I saw it. So the film for me, uh, it's not... A lot, a lot of people are fortunate to get a movie made about them. Uh, uh, to me, it was never anything like that at all. It was just, can you get this bit of corruption in? If you get that in, I'm happy with the rest of it. That, that, that's basically what it is. And how would the, you must be proud of Martin now, man, that his career's just oh, went brilliant. to brilliant. I did, I did say, if somebody's wanting to make another movie, Martin Compton's stock has just went through the roof and you better have a big checkbook to make sure he's going to do part two. But really, uh, it was never a sequel. Anyway, it's a separate entity. It's uh, something in which Martin was approached to do the second movie. Uh, he's moved on with the BBC, done Line of Duty. he just finished that. We thought that was a good time to contact him. Not for me to contact him, it's to do with professional etiquette, where Ray Burdus and his agents contacted Martin Compton and his agents for the time we got some feedback, he then done another six part series with, with Virgil. The funding for the film is still there, but the people would build it around Martin Compton doing the lead role, but unfortunately, and we respect Martin's view, it's not something that, that he needs to do because he'd done the first one. No, it'd have been easier, but the, the, there's probably an opportunity there for a, a new up and coming lead role actor to do it, but whether that's going to happen, in the short period or not, I don't know. I've always seen Robert Carlyle playing a, a Paul Ferris man. Uh, I think he's too old for me. <laughs> <laughs> I met I met Bobby. He's a really nice guy. Uh -huh. uh, I think I think uh, Robert Carlyle would play a massive, massive uh, Rob Carlyle's. Uh -huh. Really, so watch this face. It could happen. Aye. Aye. I know you've got a lot of things in the pipeline which we'll no mention yeah, but yeah. Reg McKay who will get a mention to Paul you're very close to Reg you still speak about him to this day mm -hmm. he's been in tweets and he's kind of when you talk about people getting your platforms and stuff like that you owe him a lot because he put everything into your books well, there. what a lot of people might not know is Reg was my social worker or probation as they use in England uh, when I was 16 and he'd done two or three reports and it obviously worked because he got admonished and never heard from him for many, many years uh, until he was wanting to write about uh, a new book about the Black Hill fatalities on the early 50s and 60s where the local people in the area were making their own alcohol and there was a few people who died. 
And I thought at that time, I've read a, an intelligence report on the Data Protection Act, and I thought, you right, right, let's write a book about this. So we engaged in uh, that. Reg believed in me, and I, I gave him enough encouragement to show that his belief was right. Uh, it was a sad loss. Uh, the memory still continues. He gave me a platform. I never wrote the books for any financial reason because I know a lot of money. You're not going to retire for writing books. Uh, gave me a platform to 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 uh, counterback my views. Let me have my say and 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 discuss what needs to be discussed. And if there was any elements of slander in the books, then surely I'd have been brought to court for anything that's, that's, that's not right, because that's the way it goes. And then the platform uh, goes for yourself, James. You've given me two platforms for me to speak about. It. It's cathartic. Red uses the word cathartic when I was writing the book. It helped me. You helped me, allowing me to discuss me on your platform for other people to go and fact check and say, either he's talking absolute bang on or... No, <laughs> it's not for me to decide that. It's the, it's the the audience as a jury to decide what they want. You'll get enemies throwing things on and saying, "There's no money," and I don't mean to laugh about this, but most of them are dead or retired anyway. Uh, you get the odd what we call trolls want to throw a couple of things in. We've all had issues with with things like that, but. People who are genuinely enough looking to uh, explore, is this guy right or is he wrong? What evidence can we check? The, the internet's there. And even if the internet's not there, go to your local library, go into the microfish, look, go in and look at the newspaper reports and you'll find how wrong the Daily Record and the Sunday Mail have been for years because they were the mouthpiece for Strathclyde Police that made my mum cry on a Sunday and now they'll be crying because they're now exposed. But all the journalists are all retired and moved on. But that was a deliberate propaganda approach to demonise me in the public without the nature of the internet search. So I'm not going to search on media reports. I'm not saying <clears throat> I'm an angel. What I'm saying is I was reading stuff about me that was never true and my mum was crying because of that. And I don't forget that either. Are you a man who certainly doesn't forget, Paul? Would you think your biggest fight in life has been the jingles was against the coppers? Uh, no, that's funny. That was done. It's, well, I would say it was a score draw. There was nobody one in and it. Mm-hmm. It's either one each or two each. Uh, the biggest fight I've had to know is going straight. That's <laughs> fucking. <laughs> oh, that is a yeah. fucking. Is a, I know I'm swearing. I shouldn't swear because one of the podcasts that I've been involved in is gritty net. You're not allowed to swear. Mm-hmm. You oh, swear they go beep. <laughs> How are you finding that, Paul? Oh, it's, it's weird, James. I uh, get invited onto a panel where one's... Uh, that, that, I, I won't spoil anything for the audience, but I'll make it available later on. You might even be subject matter for an interview, James, because it's a panel. It's totally different. It's something which I thought, Do you know what? I'll mention it's Gritty Nitty, mm-hmm. and the fellow who mentioned the title, I said, why did you call it that? He says, because it's a bit above getting to the nitty gritty. <laughs> mm-hmm. We supply the answers. So it's good. It's an open debate. And uh, I think podcasts are, should be des- designed anyway for uh, educational purposes, moving on. What is the message? Your message is quite clear. You get to the core meat to who your, uh, who your subject matter is, James. And you do it well. You've got... You've, you've got what, 100 million views? Oh, million views and downloads, aye. Oh, oh, oh. Not too You'll bad. a billion shortly. Billion in the next three years, mate, not a problem. Aye. But we have had a good rapport. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for the, the last two fo- podcasts. The, the feedback I get is uh, very positive, James, but I like... There's not a lot of criticism in it. I don't know if you mm-hmm. edit, maybe the supplies come back, but some of them are... You look through them, they're all too good. Mm-hmm. I like you back a bit of criticism but this one run uh, I think it's only fair to, to let people go and fact check uh, what's right and what's wrong mm-hmm. what you don't find online you will get in the library yeah what about getting married Paul what age did you get married uh, too late <laughs> I've only been <laughs> married once uh, was that in the good years of your life that was when 
Uh, it was it was brilliant. It mm. was brilliant. Uh, first time I'd, I had a, a a real family, I felt secure. Uh, moving forward, the farm was bought because my wife wanted the farm, and I, and I got it. Uh, there's been a lot of things where I've actually not seen my kids for maybe eighteen months now. Is that hard, Paul? Ah, yes, I say. But COVID's played a part in that. Finances have played a part in that. But uh, it's pressures that you've got to deal with, it. Mm-hmm. And how are you dealing with things now then, moving on? Though, or? Well, I've, I've got a new opportunity, uh, a few more challenges. I've got my cousin Kim and her so husband Lewis Kim. that's just threw me right under a bus mm-hmm. and said, get this yard sorted out for me. Uh, provided me with uh, a bit of security, a bit of financial stability. Uh, but I, st- I need to earn, James. I need mm-hmm. to get back into the game. It's a bit like you with your boxing and, l- and understanding what boxers are. It uh, doesn't matter how many rounds you're in there. If, if you hit the cat, I've hit the canvas t- two or three times. It's some orthodox moves that's been put me in the deck, but I get up, the fight's not over yet. Mm-hmm. Whether it's twelve rounds, fifteen rounds, or whatever, fight's not finished yet. I think that's why Glasgow guys were different, man. Were different, I don't see much Glasgow. Yeah, it's to anybody with a bit of passion, a bit of buzz, and a bit of heart. Like. But the whole thing about it is, James, if it's no for you, throw the towel one, mm-hmm. walk away, on the basis that you had enough, you recognise you had enough, because that's a learning process. Mm-hmm. Not to be resentful that you're a loser. No, you took part in something. You're either going to be a winner or you're going to be a loser. I ain't a loser yet. Mm-hmm. I've lost a lot of money paying a lot of people with taxes and during that, that process there's a lot of people that phoenixed companies James and with the phoenix companies a lot of people don't understand maybe what phoenix in a company is they use the word phoenix like the fictitious bird that came out the ashes and how they use the phoenixing for companies is they dissolve companies and put the company into the ashes and then create something new with the same client assets, we never done that, never ever done it. Other companies did that, fair play to them for doing it, but we always get in play. There was always media reports about the Phoenix and Company, and it was just follocks for years and years and years that we had to put away. Any company that I was involved in, I never owned them, I was involved with them. They never spoke to the people who were registered in company's house, they just dismissed that. What's the point in having company house registers and directors? Nah, nah, it's not theirs, it's his. So, on that basis, trial by media, these companies are all mine. And if they're Phoenix, it's me, it's Phoenix. And we never had that. We had a lot of rough times to, to smooth it over. That's why there were so many companies. And that's when we get into the likes of Royal Bank of Scotland. The main director, Fred the Shred Goodwin, we get a check back for Royal Bank of Scotland saying, there's your balance, Let jog on, we don't want nothing to do with you. And for the benefit of people who don't know what jog on is, it's, you're not getting nothing for us. We're not liable to tell you what's going to happen. So I thought, okay, we'll go to the competition, the Bank of Scotland. No. Nope. Clydesdale, no. Nope. Airdrie Savings Bank, with Graham Pearson attached to it, is a direct, no. Flip a coin, let's go and see the Taliban. No directly, but let's go to the Habib. See what the <laughs> it's a bad day we knock back for them, eh? Yeah. Mm. And then it came to a situation where people go to understand the business concept here about factoring. And if people don't know how to factor invoices for a company, for me to legitimise myself to get involved in business, you need a business account. I never got one. I get refused three times that I thought, I ain't asking again, fuck this. And then the business accounts was all to do with, if I'm doing business for you and I've got a factoring service, that factoring service needs to check your credibility that you're going to pay me before they take that on. We dealt with big multinational companies in Scotland that had to be cleared by fact on seven. Just how it works, James, for the benefit of people who don't know. The invoices that we get 
for the client that we do the security work for, the invoices get collected and put back towards a financial institution called a factor that will take these invoices and charge you, charge me at that time, one and a quarter percent over base rate just for pr uh, producing the invoices. They only give me 85% of the totality of the invoices at that time because we've got to get wages to pay security representatives every week. So they give us 85% of it. So technically, by the time you get into the fourth week, the invoices get cleared and it moves on. When you get people that uh, spurious police intelligence reports saying that we're involved in money laundering, technically that means that you've got money to put in a bank to launder. We never put any money in a bank. We were relying on the credibility getting paid for the factor for the client that gives us the money. And when they did give us the money, I could have went and threw that out in cash because I've proved where the clear source of funds is. And it got to a stage that because the banking facility would never accept us, the factoring facility said, Paul, see if you're money laundering, son. <laughs> you're the worst one we've ever came across. We're now your bank. Mm -hmm. We'll take your finances on. And they did. Until we had to change a company and then change another company. Wasn't it Phoenix? It was just because of weak positions with bank managers who was listening to police propaganda that we were doing a lot of things. And if we were doing all these things, surely I'd be in jail down there for all this crime, Phoenix and threatening, money laundering. No, but I'm sitting here talking to you now, explaining what happened in the past. Was that all the stuff that came out in the papers? And huh? Do you feel like... Uh, <clears throat> You were a target, a main target, especially if you've got directors there and they're skipping past the was, that I, I, that I, I, you. It was, and one, one of the sad things, James, was one of the guys that, we, that was brought on board, I never knew him, uh, I'll just mention his name is Joe. Right? Joe was a, a financial guy involved in a, an offshore company called Keystone Valves, a drilling multinational company, oil company in the Middle East. He had a few personal issues where no for me to get into, but I think he lost one of his family and lost his marriage through, and he went on a drink. Uh, somebody had recognised his past, uh, wanted him to get involved with the finances, with the security company, which he did. And one of the things I remember with Joe, personally, in an operational situation was, he used to chase off invoices up on the basis that invoices should be paid within 30 days. They don't. They get paid maybe 45 days. If somebody's not looking at the invoices, it could be 60 days, could be 90 days. So when Joe parachuted himself in to be the financial guy, he's demonstrating to me what he's capable of doing, right? There's a multinational company that he's wanted to chase for, I think it was 96 grand. And he got the letter, showed me the letter, and then said to me, Paul, I ain't even putting a stamp on this I'm going to hand deliver it I went Joe are you sure because I was concerned we're going to lose a client I said what makes you don't want to put a stamp on it Joe he says because they're upstairs <laughs> because we went out and hand delivered it two days later we get paid and I thought you know it's magic uh, we got my flat uh, got my car got my fuel card got my nice wage there was nothing for a business side that that should have disrupted his flow. But there was an investigation with uh, BBC Scotland on the expose of the security walls. And there was a female involved in that, I don't mention her name, but she bypassed Joe, bypassed the directors, wanted to speak to the owner of the company, which is me. So I wasn't the owner of the company. They're saying it was I was only the owner of the company. And I went and done the interview. When I spoke to Joe after that, he made a complaint. He said, Paul, I'm gonna make a complaint to the press complaints and, and I said, Joe, you're wasting your time. No, no, no. I'm a legitimate businessman and this is what I want to do. I says, All right. Go and do what you're done. And he done it, put the complaints in and 
I just bypassed them, and there was a few other things, nasty things about the company and all the rest of it. Joe was found in a bath one day. He committed suicide, no long after it. He got up one morning, got himself dressed, suited up, shirt and tie, uh, that let me know that he wanted to be found the way he was dressed, and cut his wrists and went into the bath. Never left a note, but I was conscious of the fact that uh, there was other troubles in his mind, uh, and I don't think that exposing and investigation helped matters any. Can't put any blame on that's the real cause yet, but these are the, the kind of casualties that, that happened when people don't want to talk to the, the, the main uh, directors that's involved in companies, they want to bypass it because they know better. They know better than Customs House, they know better than who the directors are. They want to listen to the tittle chat all the way. Sam Pollen or her name, I shouldn't have mentioned that, but I called her Sam Pollen for what she'd done. And she was also involved in an underground exposure with Russell Finlay. Uh, Sunday Mail journalist. And I hope they done. They, they went and uh, done an expose on a variety of security companies. There was a girl, Nancy Jones, who said I owned the company. Nancy was brilliant in sales. Nancy was gain fuel comfort value. Nancy's only remedy was that she got a contract, it was a Louis Vuitton bag or a Chanel bag. She'd have told anybody exactly what it was, but she did say I owned the company, which was wrong, technically. So they latched on that. So the whole element of the, the propaganda, I never owned them. I wish I did own them, because I should have got the respect mm -hmm. for the professionalism and how they conducted their business. So these documentaries and films are saying you're in these companies, but you know yourself, Paul, the media kill people, look at the poor last of Caroline mm -hmm. Flack, or the mm -hmm. videos and photos, I think there was photos of blood, but it wasn't even hers, I, th mm -hmm. I think it was her blood and no her, her man's. Uh, and the well, I, 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 I did say to Samantha Paula when she'd done the interview, I said, you've got a budget for this documentary. And you've got to justify your your saying. You know, sue them for that then for false I've information. No, I've, nah, I've, the problem is, and, and for your audience, some of your audience might know, and, and the other parts won't know. People like me, who have got convictions and went to prison, are technically devoid of any character in law, because we're already by definition of bad character by our convictions. And even though I've not had a conviction for nearly 20 years, I'm still all bad con character. The, the convictions will never be spent. That's why they pushed it with the security industry authority. That's why I've not got a license to be involved in pubs, clubs, taxis, anything to do with that license industry. And the threats to people who that I was involved with in that license industry was they'd go and approach them and say, you better remove that security or you're going to lose your license. We'll have an adverse effect for your licensing sergeant that will put in front of your committee. So somebody that spent maybe a million quid re regenerating a nightclub that's been told, get me off the doors, of course I've got to do it. It was all propaganda. I can now sit back and look at it and let people wonder what it was all about. And how I survived it all was, I blame myself. My background was to do with me. My ripple effect is the things that I've done in the past. I can't rectify it but don't crucify me for going straight. What I'm trying to do and make amends for stuff. I'm not going to make amends for other people, I'm going to make amends for myself. And my 20th year anniversary is a testament towards people saying, what is rehabilitation? I'll tell them next year, on the 21st of January, rehabilitation's a myth. I don't need the government to tell me I've been rehabilitated. I know I've done it myself, without any of their help. And if they're prepared to leave me out of that, that vacuum. What are they doing for other people who are trying to be rehabilitated? It's a farce. What do you think now, Paul, then? Do you think you've moved past that and you've grown to another chapter of your life? Uh, I, I, I've, I think I've moved. I've got, I've got to a level where when I was 16 to I was criminally involved in serious and organised crime to when I'm out now, there's, a, there's an uneven balance. I've spent the last 40 years, 20 of being involved in criminality and 20 of you going straight. So, and people ask, well, what's the trigger mechanism for that? The trigger mechanism for that is, if you want to spend the rest of your life getting out of prison, you've not learnt nothing. That took me 20 years to learn that. Better late than never.
but what I'm not expecting is to be threatened to get put to prison for anything at all. I'll go to prison for something that I believe in, but I don't want to. Let that threat to go and do something physical to prove a point through a commercial situation that you were getting bullied. I was mentally no in tune with what rational people would be doing, but I'm sure that anybody want to listen to it and look at my circumstances say, you were fucking lucky not to have done it, and I was. Mm. A lot of rumours about the Paul Ferris, the follow-up with the wee man, I know we've spoke a bit briefly there, but what is the plans for it? We're going to be seeing that in the screens in the next it's couple not, of years? It's not a follow-up to the wee man, it's not a sequel. Mm. It was something which is a standalone. The investors looked at it and <clears> said, can we get six series out of that that covers Glasgow, Newcastle, uh, Liverpool, Manchester, London, and then a a Spanish one, where my right, right. uh, well, one, mm -hmm. where it's a bit, a bit funny. It's like what you call the Tartan Mafia that was over there. It was all about crime that was done wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, it was more of a humour. It's a serious and organised not crime, mm -hmm. uh, but very funny, true stories. And I think we apply that to crime story. Uh, it's funny than than glamorised. You don't hate glamour. That's so funny. That is a six part yeah. But what we're now looking at is because Martin Compton is now fully committed to the BBC as a new up-and-coming lead actor to come and take the role on it. So that, that's not done to me. That's done to Ray Burdus and the investors to confirm, yeah, we'll go with that. Mm -hmm. So it's not a sequel. It's a six-part thing that's, that's going on. So moving forward for the future as well, Paul, what's, what's the plans? Well, I've been asked to get involved in the podcast again, mm -hmm. the, the gritty nitty sort of mm. four man team thing where can people watch this and, and, uh, I'll and be on to this? It'll, it'll be the, on YouTube mm -hmm. uh, there'll be a variety of different links uh, I've asked to get involved in Well uh, which is another project called the Street Pulse Group it's based in Stoke, Stoke and Trent um, there's a mission statement and a business statement be put to for investors it's basically focused on uh, not so much re-offenders or people who've been involved in crime it's to do with people with mental health issues, uh, substance abuse issues. And it's going to take a bit of funding, don't get us wrong, but we're trying to get uh, Bobby Cummins and a few other massive people to come on board with it. And it's something that I passionately believe in. Uh, I would actually pay to get involved in it, but if I get paid for a consultant, then it's fine. Uh, but it's something which th there'll be more information forthcoming, mm -hmm. James. So what, how, do you think you've learnt a lot then all the last few years about the business side of things? Uh, no enough, no enough. Mm. I should have had a proper advisor, at the, the financial advisor at the start. Maybe no, I had half the problems, but again, even if I did have, there would still be the political views on, it's him. He's embarrassed us in court, he's embarrassed us in public, he's embarrassed us in his books, he's embarrassed us in his film. So I am a target for them. And if I was them, they would be a target for me as well. So, but justify it. Remember, they're employees. I'm my own boss. They want to make themselves up the level and get more of a, a pension for getting the guy that got done the guy that seen the guy that embarrassed the guys. That's their problem, not mine. I don't need to justify myself to anybody apart from my family and my friends and people who believe in me. Uh -huh. But they, they feel should understand that don't go to your remit for what you get paid for because it'll come back and bite you in the arse one day. Yeah. What about another book for the future as well, Paul? Another book. I'm doing the book on the 20th anniversary. Uh, it going straight. Initially, we were going to call it Unfunny's Business, the business years. But because of recent issues, we, uh, this is what happens you get involved in contracts, James, mm -hmm. with publishers that You've only got 25% of your saves. It's my fucking life. If I want to do an audio book and I want to do another book about my life, then don't tell me about my percentage on what I can say. So I'm doing the Ferris Conspiracy 2 book, my book, my self-publishing book, my self-publishing audio book that's going to cover the last 20 years. And it'll be a conspiracy on the same one that the initial Ferris Conspiracy was about the criminal conspiracy with the judiciary were done to me. It's never been addressed. It's been out there in public. People don't want to know about it. There's been a few comments on it, but the ones in the power that they don't want to even comment. They don't even want to get a review. Mm -hmm. 
unfunny's business, the putting the conspiracy to rest was a tribute to Reg. Again, they don't want to review it because the secret audio tape transcripts are in there about threats to kill for senior official members of Strathclyde police, police officers. Talking about Meldon, members of the public, and I'm a member of the public at that time. But I wasn't acting as a member of the public, I was involved in criminality. Does that justify talking about somebody killing them? I don't know. It's there for people to read and judge and fact check again. The next book run is The Ferris Conspiracy 2 is about Fred Goodwin, all the other pretentious people, the Pink Mafia in Glasgow, who were getting all the contracts and for, for building new housing estates and all the rest of it. And I'm supposed to have dirt on them. I never had any dirt on them. The only dirt I had was on my shoe. And I recognise that sometimes you need to clean it. The problem they had, they never cleaned that. And I get blamed for political insurgency, financial insurgency. They'll read it in the new book and people want to fact check it again. I'm no better. I just want to put uh, my views out there and, and leave it there. When was the last time you were in Black Hole, Paul? Uh, I done a review uh, for Donald McIntyre uh, for one of his, uh, his documentaries. Watched that. I did, I showed them where I was actually born in Black, I was born in 19 Hoggard Field Street in the bedroom. You know, it's no, you don't go to hospital, I was born in that bedroom. Mm -hmm. And all that for me was brilliant growing up, total memories. Uh, so the last time I was, uh, and, and then I noticed, and I had to phone my sister and say, you won't believe this. They've got new houses down at the, the waterfalls. It was called Piss Alley. <laughs> People used to commit the problem I won. Uh, if the, the public toilets were filled, they'd just piss in there. And... No, it's Valley View Falls. It's brilliant. It's a good regeneration. But they, they took the heart out of the place. But I think there's a lot of good people still in there. And in uh, and, mm -hmm. and full respect to Black Hill and its mastery. And it's moved on a bit and fair play to them. What do you think of Glasgow in the whole, mate? It's a fucking rough city. Uh, do you know what? It's run by... Uh, the serious organised crime group, which was Strathclyde Police, uh, they fitted up that many people. All you need to do is go and research Ernie Barry, Tommy Campbell, Joe Steele, uh, Raymond Gilmore, loads and loads of people. If they never go to you one way, they get you another way. For me, they knew I was doing things and get away with it, so that's the pious perjury aspect of it. But Glasgow in itself, there is a lot, I'm not going to shit in Glasgow. Glasgow's a beautiful city. I'm part of that beautiful city, whether they like it or not. Politicians, two-faced cunts. Sorry for swearing, <laughs> but, but they are. Uh, they should elect people. Tommy Sheridan, totally assassinated uh, verbally, his character. He could have been a big guy for the city. But no, they want people in there that they can massage and manipulate. Uh, Glasgow makes people, does it? No, people make Glasgow. And it doesn't need to be a pink sign. Mm -hmm. I know you drank in post a couple of things. I know you knew my uncle and my uh, grand on that as uh, well. I know some of your family, uh, James. Uh, it was just people mistakenly get yourself involved. I know you came for the streets, so maybe that's why we get such a rapport mm -hmm. that you know I'm for the streets. I know you're for the streets. And for clarification, I've only ever met you two or three times during the podcast. Mm -hmm. But I know your family. I respect your family, James. And you've got a few personal issues for yourself that, that growing up, as much as you interview people as well, James, that have got issues that you want to cultivate and bring out mm -hmm. to, to, to explain, there'll maybe come a time for you, for me to sit down, maybe for that audience and gritty night and say, right, James, we saw this podcast, million, mm -hmm. million, have like one billion views is all, but <laughs> you never know. Uh -huh. So it's something which you get you get subject matter, James, and you, you get the core material for the audience mm -hmm. you're an entertainer you're, you're somebody that's got a podcast for your agenda no empty else's exactly and i think we've got a good chemistry so it's good listen mate if i'm going to go on anybody's it'll be yourselves probably, probably. Out of the favor Thanks. will be returned yeah. mate you've gave yeah. me millions of views mate yeah. i'm sure i can return the favor all right mate hold you to that <laughs> <laughs> say, before we finish up brother would you like to finish up with anything yourself paul i, I think uh to reflect on the request that you made james online on Twitter about asking uh, any questions to come forward. The one that leaps out to me was asking why 
he shot Max Haley's stereo. If you're getting into a situation to have a serious discussion with somebody, the last thing you want is irritating your ears as some music blasting it. So maybe to neutralise that, it might have been the right thing to do. But Mick Keeley, God rest him, turned out to be a really nice, genuine guy. And I'm going to move on and speak a bit further. Things during the trial for the bank robbery that Mick Keeley was involved in, because Blink wants to do a, an interview with me, on how I've not seen him for 20 years. And I think I ought to, maybe he's friends with my dad's and done a few other things. So I think it's only fair that I explore a variety of different things. So watch this space, James. Why not, After, please? no, and the reason for the being, they asked me quite before it, James, but I knew that you wanted to do the third and final one of you mm. with, with, with this one. Uh, and it would be a total disrespect if I go and do something. So I don't do it. No, I appreciate that, Paul. But that shows your loyalty, like I say. I said, a trilogy. We've, yep. we've done three parts now. Yeah. But we've also got ideas and plans for the future. So I'm free well. to go and talk to other people. Exactly, mate. <laughs> you're free now, mate. But uh, yeah. no, I appreciate the loyalty you've always gave me, the respect you've always Not gave me. You've always had my back as well. And mm. that's how I know you're 100%, mate. And that's why you're respected all the UK. I'll continue, the UK, you know mate. that. Anyway. And, um, we've also got your first live audience in Glasgow which we'll be doing in March with me and yourself. James, I never knew that until you declared that. <laughs> <laughs> That's twice you've done that. <laughs> but uh, I'm, this is... Um, I'm well up for it. A live yeah. audience with yourself that we'd love to do. I've started the events company. Yep. Why not bring Paul Ferris to the stage and, mm -hmm. and, and show people, meet and greet, tell your story. And... Um, it's the first minute, so why not bring Aye, you to my no, hometown? I'm mate. well up for that, Jim. Uh, you can only check. You can, you, you're reliant on the audience. Where well, you've mm -hmm. got an, an audience that has read the books, you've got audience that's seen the documentaries, audience that's seen the film. Uh, do they want a, f a personal f thing? To, if it's there, commercialised, that, that, and it's out your business, why not do it? Mm -hmm. I'll get Joe Kozaki in January and for yourself. I would love Paul yeah. Ferris in March. Yeah. Like, I'll need to check my diary, James. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, again, brother. Mm. Phenomenal story. Very deep the day. Quite emotional it as well was, at I, times. Um, was, yeah. But I see you're in a better place as well. And But you can also see that Paul Ferris has always still got that fire not to fuck about with. It's, it's a controlling influence that I don't like bullies. I don't like to be put in a position with bullies. So if I can accommodate a, and expedite a, a decent remedy for everybody mm -hmm. to move on, then that's sensible yeah. that's the way to do it Paul it's been an absolute pleasure brother brilliant Jim thanks again God bless you and I look to see what you do for the future with the books and the, the new film comes out man watch this space exactly take care brother good man thank you boom